Our next speaker, Priscilla Lane, is Associate Professor of German at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, in 2011. She has written on representations of blackness in German film, post-war rebellion, and Turkish-German culture, published essays in the journal's German Studies Review, Colloquia Germanica, and Women in German Yearbook, and presented at conferences such as the German Studies Association, Society for Film and Media Studies, and the Collegium for African American Research. She is author of the book, White Rebels in Black, German Appropriation of African American Culture, published by the University of Michigan Press in 2018. The title of her talk today is The Stakes of Representation and Fantasy in Black German Theater, Simone Data Ayivi's First Black Woman in Space. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. <clears throat> So in this paper, um, I would like to look at an example of what I'm calling Afro-German, Afro-Futurist theater. This is a section from my current book project um, on Afro-German, Afro-Futurism called Out of This World, in which I'm looking at contemporary Afro-German theater and literature that uses science fiction and fantasy or engages in rewriting the past and imagining a future in which black life can thrive. Um, and here are just a few bullet points of the kinds of themes I'm looking at. Um, so far, I have identified three plays uh, that fit these parameters. Um, two are um, by playwright Olivia Wenzel, so one, um, Mais in Deutschland und Anderen Galaxien, um, and We Are the Universe, which she um, co-wrote um, with uh, several other performers. And then the play, or the performance I'm talking about today, Simone Dede Ayibi's First Black Woman in Space. Um, and the uh, performance I'll be discussing uh, is one that happened um, on October 21st, 2016 in the Sophienzele Theater in Berlin. One of the questions I've been struggling with um, is how one can best situate Afro-German, Afrofuturist theater within the rest of German theater history. While there is a history of Turkish or Turkish-German actors on the German stage, um, which has been addressed in um, Errol Boran's dissertation uh, from 20, 2004, or, or most recently in Ella Gezin's new book that was published this year, the participation of black Germans has been more individual and has not been formally documented. Um, in the epilogue to his monograph, Performing Unification, Matt Cornish considers the significance of incorporating more Afro-German and Turkish-German actors on the stage, on the German stage since 1989. He writes, quote, by casting an Afro or Turkish-German in a role not explicitly written for a racial other, directors can make clear how bio-German bodies go unmarked and unremarked upon on stage, uh, upon on stage, neutral, unsignifying in terms of race. An excellent example thereof um, is uh, Ante Helena Reka's uh, recent staging of the bourgeois Bavarian drama Mittelreich uh, with an all-black cast. Here I would argue that when it comes to Ayibi's production of First Black Woman in Space, this is not her goal. Um, she is not looking to normalize blackness for a white audience, and she is definitely not looking to thematize the unmarked nature of whiteness. Rather, Ayibi's audience is not white Germans at all, um, but rather black Germans. During a roundtable discussion at a conference I co-organized uh, this month in Tübingen about representations of blackness in German theater, Ayivi admitted that as a playwright, sometimes she would begin writing a play for an imagined white audience without even being self-aware of that. However, in the case of First Black Woman in Space, she sought to create positive and diversified representations of black people for black people and allow them to imagine a future in which they can not only exist, but thrive. This is not the same respectability politics that was uh, once championed in the 1990s about why positive representations of black people were needed in the media. Rather, when I say positive, I do not mean positive in a moral sense. 
uh, which typically refers to representations of middle class, law abiding, educated black people. Rather, what I really mean are representations of black people in which blackness does not depend on recognition from white, from white people. During my conversation with Ayivi this month, uh, following the round table, she remarked that white, uh, uh, white German audience members did not like first black woman in space because they didn't feel spoken to. Um, let's see. Arguably, white German theater goers are used to being the center of the universe. Um, they are used to either plays written for them, about them, or addressed to them. But first black woman in space is neither of these things. Thus, rather than situating Ayibi's performance among German dramatic movements like post-dramatic or post-migrant theater, um, I think her approach to black German theater might perhaps be more comparable to other types of Afrofuturist theater from the black diaspora. Um, while there's no distinct tradition or canon of Afrofuturist theater, um, there are some contemporary examples of playwrights, particularly in the UK, who have intentionally incorporated Afrofuturist thought. Um, and these are just some examples. So Rachel Young's Nightclubbing and Keisha Thompson's Man on the Moon. Nevertheless, the playwright I want to consider um, in comparison with Ayivi is um, African-American uh, playwright Susan Laurie Parks. While Parks is not associated with Afrofuturism in any explicit, explicit way, she is known for writing dramatic texts that collapse past, present, and future in order to better thematize the history of black people, such as her play, The Death of the Last Black Man and the Whole Entire World. Parks is also a helpful interlocutor um, because of the ways she has theorized her playwriting, um, I, I believe are helpful for understanding Ayivi's play. In an essay called um, An Equation for Black People on Stage, Parks contemplates what it would mean to write a play that does not focus on black people's recognition by whites. Quote, can a black person be on stage and be other than oppressed? For the black writer, are there dramas other than race dramas? Does black life consist of issues other than race issues? End quote. Now it be, would be easy to misinterpret Parks' words and think she's advocating writing dramatic texts that ignore racism. I believe this is not the case. Parks is not denying the fact that black lives are overdetermined over by structural racism and anti-blackness. Rather, she is pointing out the necessity for portraying black life that does not reduce it to oppression. Resisting a singular plot line is necessary, both so that the diversity among black people is recognized and so that black people can maintain hope for a better future and find ways to work towards it. Um, Parks continues, as there's no single black experience, there's no single black aesthetic, and there's no one way to write or think or feel or dream or interpret or be interpreted. As African Americans, we should recognize this insidious essentialism for what it is, a fucked up trap to reduce us to only one way of being. We should endeavor to show the world and ourselves our beautiful and powerfully infinite variety." End quote. Although Park specifically addresses African Americans, her thoughts on race and the theater could easily apply to other diasporic groups, including black Germans. One of the things that is interesting about Park's thoughts are how she specifically proposes that black playwrights need to be willing to abandon realism. Um, in the essay, Elements of Style, Parks writes, quote, if a playwright chooses to tell a dramatic story and realizes that there are essential elements of that story which lead to writing outside of the realm of linear narrative, then the play naturally assumes a new shape. We should understand that realism, like other movements in other art forms, is a specific response to a certain historical climate. I don't explode the form because I find traditional plays boring. I don't really. It's just that these structures never could accommodate the figures which take up residence inside me." End quote. Park's view provides an alternative to that of uh, German dramaturg Bernd Stegemann. Um, in his 2015 published book, Lob des Realismus, Stegemann argues that, especially now in our age of late capitalism and neoliberalism, realism is more necessary than ever before because of how it reveals the problems in society between the classes and helps us identify solutions. 
In contrast to his praise for realism, Stegemann is critical of avant-garde art, which he sees as having dominated German theater since the 1960s. Stegemann's problem with avant-garde artwork lies largely with its relationship to the audience. Stegemann argues that one of the reasons why avant-garde artists rejected realism was because while realism sought to present objective, universal truths about society, the avant-garde focused on the relativism of seeing and therefore stressed each individual's experience with the artwork. But as a result of this avant-garde intervention, Stegemann finds individuals in the audience can no longer see their own role in, in the society, and therefore they lose any motivation to try and change anything. In this paper, by looking at a performance of Ayibi's first black woman in space, I want to consider how Afro-German, Afro-futurist theater possibly represents a bridge between realist and avant-garde art in the manner that Susan Laurie Parks suggests. It might seem counterintuitive to search for realism within works of art that incorporate science fiction and fantasy, challenge linear time, and imagine alternative worlds. Nevertheless, I argue that Afro-German, Afro-futurist theater uses avant-garde aesthetics to achieve realist effects in the audience. In First Black Woman in Space, Aibi uses Afrofuturism as a lens through which the real existing problems of black people can be better understood and possible solutions can be imagined. Um, before I proceed with my analysis of Aibi's play, I, I just want to present you with the characteristics I have in mind when I say there is a presence of avant-garde aesthetics in Afro-German, Afrofuturist theater. Unlike in realist theater, Ayibi does not intend to recreate the world as we know it. And she's not really trying to convince us that she is on another planet or exploring space. The audience, uh, rather, the goal of Ayibi's performance is to produce spe a specific kind of effect in the audience. The audience needs to imagine what might be possible in space or in another time and place in order to consider how they might change their current behavior in order to achieve this future. Despite these avant-garde tendencies, Afro-German Afrofuturism still aspires to achieve the effects of realism, namely helping the audience to both identify current problems and imagine possible solutions. In order to demonstrate this, I want to consider two topics addressed in the performance, representation and the future. Representation is of particular importance at the start of the play. Uh, when Ayivi's performance begins, the stage is shrouded in darkness what is faintly visible are two chairs facing the audience. One is empty and one has an empty astronaut suit slumped inside of it. To the audience's right, a screen stands slightly to the side and behind the chairs. First, it is illuminated with a bright white light. This is followed by darkness with several faint lights visible, which seem to resemble stars. The bright white light seems to indicate that the show is beginning. And the lights resembling stars are perhaps meant to transport us into space. Off stage, Ayibi begins her monologue. Initially, we cannot see her, but she is soon faintly visible. Um, her monologue begins as follows. Dr. Macy Jameson had been interested in natural sciences and mathematics since she was a child, but sometimes she also watched television. Lieutenant Uhura was the first woman that she saw weekly on television working in a technical occupation. Seeing Lieutenant Uhura, evoked a new picture of possibilities for Mae Jemison. In any case, she claims that if it had not been for Uhura, she would never have gotten the idea of becoming an astronaut. And so in 1992, she became the first woman of color from the planet Earth who traveled into space. In this moment of the performance, the value of representation is reflected in multiple layers. Jameson is an important figure for Aivi because her journey into space conveyed to Aivi that a black woman could do anything. And in Jameson's case, her aspirations are directly linked to Nick Nichols' role as Uhura on Star Trek. What is notable about how Aibi tells the story is that her narrative bl blurs the lines between representation and reality. Following Aibi's narrative, it is impossible to tell which person, the real astronaut Jameson, or the imagined space traveler Uhura, had more of an impact on black people. This is conveyed when Ayivi also relays how, years after her first mission, Jameson finally got to meet Nichols at a Star Trek convention. And understandably, Nichols was just as excited about meeting Jameson as Jameson was about meeting Nichols. 
At a moment of improvisation, Ayivi departs from the script and asks, quote, so who actually was the first black woman in space, end quote. But if Jameson hadn't seen Nichols perform that role on television, would she have ever become an astronaut? Ayivi ends this portion of the performance with the profound statement, you cannot be what you cannot see, which is a quote from Marion Wright Edelman, an African-American advocate for child welfare. The second concept I want to discuss is the future. How does Ayibi's engagement with the future still, affect the, uh, still achieve the same effects as realism? In order to better explain this, first I must assert that in my opinion, in contrast to realism, Afrofuturism presents one of the best methods of addressing current social problems for black people. Here I would like to refer to some thoughts uh, put forth by African American philosophy professor Lewis Gordon. At present, within American black studies, there are uh, a few possible approaches to the present circulating Afro-pessimism, which we heard about yesterday uh, in Dr. El Tayeb's talk, um, black optimism, and Afrofuturism. Gordon differentiates between uh, Afro-pessimism and black optimism by stating the following, um, quote, optimists expect intervention from beyond Pessimists declare relief is not forthcoming, end quote. Gordon answers this conundrum by stating, quote, the future is yet to come. Facing the future, the question isn't what will be or how do we know what will be, but instead the realization that whatever is done will be that on which the future will depend, end quote. As an example of how Ayivi enacts this way of thinking about the future, I want to consider one segment um, which occurs midway through the performance. So at this moment in the performance, Ayivi lies down on the floor on top of what appears to be a giant white inflatable cloud. Uh, and later this will be inflated and hung from the ceiling as a kind of large white planet. While lying on the floor, Ayivi gives the following monologue. We are looking at the stars. We want to go up. Together we can break through glass ceilings. We get cut. We have glass shards in our hair. We collapse together on the couch. We help each other remove shards from our hair. We sleep in. We get up. We wear ourselves out. We climb upwards, head up towards our goal, a wonder overcoming gravity. Thick layer of gra glass. Run, fly, maximum speed. Thick layer of glass. Bang, blow back, lift off. Bang, blow back, lift off. Bang, blow back, lift off. Bang, blow back up and down, up and down, cuts in brown skin, glass shards in your hair, up, down, up, woman after woman after woman, and now all together, and now with feeling, and now from the beginning. We don't know how many have banged their heads until the first crack in the glass formed. How hard um, was her impact? How deep were the cuts? We don't know how many blows will be necessary. And does anyone else have shards in their hair? And what will it take for us to leave the shards on the ground instead of always wasting time with cleaning them up? In this segment, Ayivi is basically asking black women to imagine that they can and they will break through whatever glass ceilings have been put and will be put in their way. She stresses they will likely experience some cuts and setbacks along the way, but it's important to keep going. It's particularly striking that Ayivi says we will never know how many have banged their heads to create the tiny cracks before one finally breaks through. In Ayivi's glass ceiling performance, she both acknowledges that each new generation stands on the shoulders of those who struggled before them, but also that even the current generation has to accept the fact that they may not live to see the future they are fighting for. By hoping for the best, Ayivi enacts what um, Gordon calls acting in the absence of teleological determination meaning acting without definitively knowing all possible outcomes, but hoping for the best. Finally, I find it important that Ayibi's text often resembles a song, particularly when she repeats the lines, bang, blow back, lift off, up and down, up and down, um, cuts in br brown skin, up, down, up. These sound like dance moves. She is choreographing black women's resistance. Um, the importance of music um, and dance can be found throughout the performance. She claims there's a record player on stage which plays various hits um, from black female vocalists um, and she says is going to help transport us to another world, um, which, could, 
which could be read as a reference to jazz artist Sun Ra, who believed white supremacy has made Earth a toxic place for people of color, and the best solution would be to leave this world and find another. Um, there's also a moment in the performance when Ayivi unearths a disco ball from a pile of wreckage. I interpret this, the earlier dancing mention and the disco ball as stressing the potential of music to help change society and impact lives. By dancing, um, oh, I forgot to include, so there's a picture of, there's a moment in the performance where she's wearing a spacesuit, dancing, and you see like a reflection of her or a projection of another person in a spacesuit dancing. Um, and I believe that um, in this scene, she enacts what Michael Dowdy calls acting in concert, a term he borrows from Hannah Arendt. Um, Dowdy asserts that while dancing, individuals can create a counter public resisting the individualism of neoliberalism and late capitalism. Secondly, by resurrecting the disco ball, Aivi celebrates black dance and pleasure by recalling disco's roots in subcultural spaces occupied by people of color, the working class, gays, and lesbians. A further way that current social problems are related to imaginations of the future is when Aivi incorporates the views of other black German women via recorded interviews. In these interviews, we not only hear about real existing problems of black people in Germany, um, but we also hear how Afrofuturist ideas can inspire political action to solve them. Um, so after, so first she has a kind of a mock interview with Jameson, who's represented by this empty spacesuit. Um, and then we are presented with a series of black German women, including public figures like German studies scholar and activist Peggy Pisha, who you see here, um, and black British author Sharon Dodua Otto, um, and one school-aged girl, um, whom the audience all sees via this video screen. Each person shares testimony about a variety of topics, ranging from what they wish for in the future um, to how important community is to them. During the moments when they are not speaking, they remain as witnesses. But rather than observing Aivi, they appear to be observing the audience. An example, and you know, if the audience has German or white German audience members, this could be seen as a reversal of the colonial or racist gaze, um, which is even more empowering within a space that is normally marked by race, racial and class privilege like the theater. So, um, in these videos, each person stands before a black backdrop um, with what looks like stars floating behind them. Thus, rather than locating these women in a specific time and place, this backdrop makes their testimony seem eternally rev relevant, uh, but perhaps even coming from the future. Um, and this reminded me of this billboard. So this billboard, there are black people in the future, was part of this project, I think in Pittsburgh, of different artists putting up billboards. And when this one was put up, people complained to the building manager <laughs> that they said it was offensive and, I don't know, divisive? I'm not sure. So, th so they had to take it down. So, so as has be become evident from the recent removal of this billboard, apparently it is offensive and divisive to even assert black people's presence in the future. But why? Um, I believe Sarah Ahmed um, would explain this by s with the following quote. Um, when you are not supposed to live as you are, where you are, with whom you are with, then survival is a radical action, a refusal not to exist until the very end, a refusal not to exist until you do not exist. We have to work out how to survive in a system that decides life for some requires the death or removal of others." End quote. Thus, one of the ways first black woman in space motivates the audience to action is by posing the question, what if Afrofuturism and political commitment could go hand in hand? And we see this reflected in one of the most important prompts Aivi poses to the black German women, um, the question, what should black activism in Germany look like? And I'd like to consider the responses given by two women interviewed, um, Sharon and Amina. In her response, Sharon declares that Black Lives Matter is the most important movement for her at the moment. Um, she also makes a connection between the current epidemic of police shootings of black men in the US and the lynch mobs of the post-Reconstruction South. Making this connection can be related to Afrofuturist thought because it contradicts linear progress. 
If a narrative of linear progress would suggest that conditions for black people are supposed to get increasingly better, especially following the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and more recently, two terms of America's first black president, then a challenge to this progress narrative would suggest that time passing does not indicate improvement. Rather, things can, at any moment, return to being bad and perhaps get even worse. Another way that Sharon's statement resonates with Afrofuturism is when she wonders how our ancestors, who were faced with the threat of lynch mobs, didn't give up hope, um, another example of acting in the absence of teleological determination. Amina's response brings us full circle by once again bringing up the importance of representation. She states it's important that she, as a black German female teacher, is present in the classroom as a figure of respect and authority standing in front of white German children. Amina's assertion that activism, she also says that activism entails not just protesting but going to the beach with friends. Um, and this brings up the importance of the everyday, that real change requires both protesting and being present in public spaces. While Ayibi's performative acts introduce per fantasy to the performance, these videos allow other black German women to both speak directly to current political problems and suggest possible solutions. But I'm not suggesting that First Black Woman in Space simply presents a dialectic of fantasy and realism where realism can be located in the interviews and fantasy in Ayibi's performance. Rather, both Ayibi's performance and the women's testimonies blur the lines between fantasy and reality by showing how fantasy can be a space to enact the solutions to real problems and reality can be a space in which it is necessary to imagine future possibilities. Thus, despite its anti-realist avant-garde aesthetics, First Black Woman in Space allows the audience to walk away with at least one concrete idea. Sometimes we need to see something before we can truly picture it, and we need to picture it in order to achieve it. Thank you. Our final panelist, Sarah Phillips Castillo, is a professor of English at Carleton University in Ottawa, where she is cross-appointed with the Institute of African Studies and the Institute for Comparative Studies in Literature, Art, and Culture, and where she co-founded the Center for Transnational Cultural Analysis. She holds a doctorate from Columbia University and is the recipient of a Pol Polanyi Prize as well as a Horace Prince Prize. She is the author of two monographs, Second Arrivals, Landscape and Belonging in Contemporary Writing of the Americas, and Calypso Jews, Jewishness in the Caribbean Literary Imagination, which won a Canadian Jewish Literary Award. Today she will speak on Broken Citizenship, Hans J. Masakwa's Survivor Memoir, and its literary influences. Thank you. I, I really want to thank the, uh, the conference organizers for this wonderful two days. I've learned so much as a, a newcomer to this discussion. Um, and I've been really struck by how many of us are talking about life stories, life narratives from a number of different uh, disciplinary perspectives, the historical, anthropological, sociological. Um, I'm coming at this from a literary uh, studies perspective like, like Priscilla uh, and also from memory studies. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk about a memoir that I think be may, may be very familiar to many of you, Masako is uh, destined to witness, but I hope to bring a, a sort of a fresh perspective to it by making some links to a black Canadian novel. So um, this paper comes out of a larger project on litera literary and visual representations of black victims of the Nazis. My larger study, which is still at an early stage, so I very much welcome feedback, um, the larger study considers the role of writers and artists in integrating these forgotten victims into the collective memory of Nazism and the Holocaust. I look both at works by survivors created either during the war or retrospectively, and at fictional works by African diaspora writers and artists who did not themselves experience Nazi persecution, but instead imaginatively reconstruct it. I'm interested in the strategies through which both testimonial and fictional discourses challenge the dictates of collective memory that homogenize the experiences of victims of the Third Reich 
and thereby marginalize some persecuted groups. Um, and as just a sort of visual shorthand um, to sort of express this distinction that I've just made between the testimonial uh, and the fictional discourses, I'm showing you here a couple of works of visual art that I'm looking at in the larger study. Um, on your left, uh, works by the Surinamese artist uh, Joseph Nasi, who was in Belgium um, in the interwar period and then was arrested by the Nazis and interned and documented his experience during the war. Uh, and on the right uh, is a work by the late Ghanaian British writer Maud Salter from her series uh, Circus, which would um, uh, represent uh, the uh, retrospective imaginative gaze that I'm also interested in. But in this paper, I'm gonna focus on the literary uh, and briefly consider two literary texts, a memoir and a novel, that illustrate the mnemonic functions of literature. Functions that, I argue, become particularly urgent in the context of the neglected history of black victims of the Nazis. Hans J. Massacoy is destined to witness growing up black in Nazi Germany from 1999 is the most prominent of a group of autobiographical narratives that document the harrowing, yet often contradictory, day-to-day -day experiences of black people in the Third Reich. Published just over a decade later in 2011, Ghanaian-Canadian writer Essia Dujan's novel Half-Blood Blues is a key instance of a subgenre of Holocaust literature that we might call black Holocaust fiction. Notably, Adujan draws direct inspiration from Massacoy's memoir, which she cites in her bibliography. Tracing the intertextual relationship between Destined to Witness and Half-Blood Blues illustrates how literature constructs the past in part by remembering earlier texts and genres. Through intertextuality, as well as other mnemonic functions, including representing the operations of memory itself, literature actively intervenes into and reshapes memory cultures. So I'm gonna start with the, with the testimonial um, discourse with uh, the memoir. In her study of Holocaust testimony, Alexandra Waxman observes that the post-war terms the Holocaust and Holocaust survivor give a false sense of homogeneity, whereas in fact, quote, there is no universal survivor experience. The hegemony of collective memory that these terms inscribe marginalizes the stories of survivors whose testimonies don't fit comfortably within dominant narratives. Relatedly, in his penetrating analysis of the asymmetrical relationship between Jewish and Romani Holocaust archives, historian Ari Joshkowitz uh, shows how Romani testimony has been interpreted through the lens of the testimony of Jewish victims that Holocaust archives were constructed to collect and preserve. In the case of black victims of the Nazis, however, the challenge is not only to find an appropriate, uh, an appropriate interpretive and archival framework, but also to contend with the paucity of archival documentation itself. Recent efforts, such as those of University of Vienna researchers to document the presence of black uh, prisoners in Mauthausen, may be able to supply some of this missing information. Nonetheless, it remains difficult to speak of the existence of an archive of black victims of the Nazis, even in an abstract or symbolic sense. In the absence of a more fully developed documentary record and historiography, the few available memoirs, interviews, and oral histories of black victims become pivotal, as uh, do fictional reconstructions of their experiences, as I'll suggest in a moment. Scholars of black German literature have identified the centrality of life writing as a form of counter discourse that, in Michelle Wright's words, challenges and confounds German assumptions and enables the literal writing of oneself into the nation. Accordingly, Massacoy's memoir has been read in relation to the project of constructing a black German identity, of discovering blackness, and as part of a tradition of black autobiography originating in the slave narrative, uh, and also in Priscilla's uh, new wonderful book, um, there's a, a great reading as well of the memoir uh, in the context of black masculinity. Alongside such readings, uh, I think that Massacoy's heavy emphasis on his experience under national socialism, underscored by the, um, the subtitle, at least in the English version of the memoir, invites us to situate Destined to Witness as a survivor narrative that seeks recognition for a story of persecution that has been obscured by the dominant memory culture. Destined to Witness provides a detailed account of the texture of daily life for a mixed race boy growing up in Nazi Germany, 
narrowly averting arrest, Massaquay experiences many forms of exclusion, isolation, and persecution as a native-born German with a Hamburg accent and dark skin. A profound exploration of unbelonging, Massaquay's memoir exposes the striking inconsistencies of the lived experience of national socialism for black Germans. In the rise of the memoir, Alex Werdling remarks that, quote, there is an absence of inevitability in the form that captures the accidental quality of life itself and can mirror the struggle to find coherence in the disrupted experience of unanticipated change. The memoir is a form that tolerates surprise because it is not based on the expectation of moving steadily toward an end. So as an open-ended and experimental form that is relatively unfettered by rules, memoir proves well-suited to conveying the unexpected and inconsistent dimensions of daily life under national socialism. Surprise is a common response to Destined to Witness, whose readers learn, for example, of the compassion shown to the young Massacoy by a number of shopkeepers, teachers, and neighbors. By documenting the private sphere as well as the public one, Massacoy's memoir, memoir reveals the disconnections between the practice of everyday life and the dictates of state ideology. Um, th these are disconnections also that uh, I want to mention are, are um, uh, really powerfully revealed as well in the oral uh, histories that Tina Kemp collects. Uh, memoir's focus on the private sphere enables Massacoy to convey uh, both the precariousness but also the unpredictability of life for a mixed race youth in a racial state that persecuted black people but did not systematically target them with elimination. Massacoy survivor memoir transmits an unexpected image of the past, recording a dimension of the lived experience of national socialism that has been largely absent from the historiography. In so doing, Destined to Witness illustrates the power of memoir as an intimate vehicle of individual memory that can simultaneously put pressure on collective memory to acknowledge the heterogeneous experiences of victims, witnesses, and survivors. So I'd like to move now in the second part um, of my talk from, uh, from the testimonial to the fictional uh, discourse. Survivor memoirs such as Massacoy's not only record a particular image of the past, but also transmit this image to the post-war generation, thereby creating a chain of memory. One of the mechanisms of this process of transmission is the literary device of intertextuality. Intertextuality can be understood as the way in which literature remembers the past, um, the way in which literature remembers earlier uh, literary genres and texts. For example, much as neo-slave narratives recall and play with the conventions of slave, the slave narrative, black Holocaust fiction by such writers as Michelle Mayet and John A. Williams remembers the genre of the Holocaust diary. Mayet's and Williams' novels imaginatively reconstruct the diaries of black concentration camp prisoners as a means of compensating for the absence of such diaries from the archive. In this way, black Holocaust fiction exploits what memory studies theorist Astrid Earle calls the fictional privileges of literature, the poetic license that distinguishes the novel as a medium of cultural memory from memoir or historiography. Earle argues that while the operations of literature closely remember those, uh, sorry, closely resemble those of cultural memory in certain key respects, for example, in selecting certain elements and implotting them within a meaningful narrative structure. Fiction uh, uniquely reshapes our understanding of the past through the interplay between the real and the imaginary, the factual and the counterfactual. In this way, she suggests, literature can inject new and distinct elements into memory culture. So a number of works of black Holocaust fiction, uh, like uh, these two um, novels that I'm showing on the slide, uh, engender this transaction between the real and the imaginary by presenting themselves as wartime diaries, so they're fictionalized diaries. Aduchin's Half-Blood Blues, however, resists the literary device of the recovered diary in favor of maintaining more characteristically novelistic conventions such as alternating temporalities. Aduchin only loosely reproduces the retrospective narrative voice of the memoir form and eschews a direct presentation of the concentration camp. 
Instead of mimicking the conventions of the diary or memoir genres, Half-Blood Blues engages in a different kind of intertextuality by invoking a specific memoir, Massacoy's Destined to Witness. In so doing, she recirculates and reframes from a post-memorial African diaspora pers perspective the black German historical experience that Massacoy records. Half-Blood Blues recovers the history of black victims of the Nazis by revisiting the jazz scene in interwar Germany. In Adugin's novel, young American and European jazz musicians join together in interwar Berlin to form the Hot Time Swingers. The band's Afro-German trumpet player, Hieronymus Falk, is one of the mixed-race children, pejoratively named Rhineland Bastards, born to white German mothers and French colonial troops who occupied the Rhineland after World War I. The novel's replaying of this historic, uh, in the novel's replaying of this historical episode, after fleeing Germany, Hieronymus is arrested by the Nazis in occupied Paris in 1940 and imprisoned in the Mauthausen concentration camp. Moving back and forth between wartime Europe and the early 1990s, Half-Blood Blues tracks the efforts of Hieronymus's former bandmates of musicologists and documentary filmmakers to determine what happened to him after his incarceration. These efforts to solve the mystery of Hieronymus's fate are emblematic of Adugin's larger literary project of recovering a lost chapter of the history of Nazi persecution. So although Half-Blood Blues was well received when it appeared in 2011, um, it won uh, Canada's uh, major literary prize, for example. Adugin's decision to set her novel in wartime Europe appeared anomalous, even somewhat puzzling, to the Canadian press and to some of her festival audiences. This response reflected a lack of awareness of a historical black presence in Germany uh, and uh, of an African diaspora intellectual tradition of comparative thinking about the Holocaust that includes the writings of M.A. Césaire, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, and others. Edugen contributes to this tradition by repositioning Massacoy's black German story within a more expansive African diaspora framework. Readers familiar with both Destined to Witness and Half-Blood Blues will be struck by Edugen's intertextual borrowings from Massacoy. Perhaps the most striking example is a scene in which Edugen's black German protagonist, Hieronymus Falk, and the African-American narrator, Sid Griffiths, visit Hagenbeck Zoo in Hamburg, from which Hieronymus, like Massacoy, hails. Upon arriving at Hagenbeck's, they encounter the infamous culture show in which black people are displayed in a human zoo. Edugen's description closely echoes that of Massacoy. Um, so uh, I'll read uh, Massacoy's first and then that from Half-Blood Blues. We arrived at the African village replete with half a dozen or so thatch-roofed clay huts and peopled, we were told, by authentic Africans. Except for their skin color and hair, the Africans on display looked nothing like my relatives or any of the Africans I had met at my grandfather's house. All of the vi villagers were barefoot and dressed in tattered rags. Two women, draped in dingy-looking cloths, were rhythmically pounding a heavy wooden stick into a mortar. A guide explained that they were making corn flour in preparation for their dinner. Um, and here is Adugin's African-American narr narrator now uh, relating this scene. Then I caught sight of a row of thatch-roofed clay huts. They could start striding hot, hard toward them, and I sort of trailed after. I just stared in amazement. I wasn't even clear on what all I was seeing at first. Then I swore softly, because it was people, black folk, barefoot dressed in rags and bones, a group of jacks squatted on flat rocks in the mud, smoking crude pipes, discs hanging from their huge earlobes. Women sat in a circle farther back, leopard print cloths tied firmly round their privates. With mortar and pestle, they was pounding cornmeal, the powder of it dusting their feet. So it's pretty clear to me that Adugin um, borrows that, uh, that scene uh, uh, from uh, the memoir by Massacoy. Both um, Massacoy's and Adugin's renderings of this scene conclude with a charged exchange of gazes between the black German observer and the African uh, performers. Yet while Half-Blood Blues closely mimics Massacoy's original account, including borrowing some of its phrasing, Adugin notably shifts perspective by filtering this scene through the more culturally distanced lens of the novel's African-American na narrator, and I'll say more on the implications of that in a moment. The intertextual influence of Destined to Witness on Adugin's novel 
can be seen not only in such plot details, but also more profoundly in Half-Blood Blue's thematic emphasis on mistaken identity and impersonation, which I don't have time to, to detail here, uh, on witnessing, and especially on what Adujin calls broken citizenship. In a 2014 lecture, Adujin identifies the problem of belonging, in particular that of citizenship, as the central concern of her fiction. She cites Nazi Germany as the most powerful example of a condition of broken citizenship in which a state disavows its own citizens. Accordingly, Half-Blood Blues explores the status of statelessness that the Nazis impose on the novel's black German and uh, German Jewish protagonists. The wartime Berlin scenes reveal how German citizenship becomes a liability in the Third Reich for those who are considered race polluters. Within the collectivity of the jazz band, the black German trumpeter Hieronymus and the German Jewish pianist Paul are aligned as sharing in a common experience of broken citizenship. As native-born Germans, they represent a threat of racial contamination from within the national body that must be eradicated. Accordingly, both men are eventually arrested and imprisoned in camps, Hieronymus in Mauthausen and Paul in Sachsenhausen, where he is murdered. Adugin's exploration of broken citizenship resonates with Masakoi's account of, how his, own, of his own uh, failed attempts to claim a German national identity that by its very definition excluded him. Despite his strong regional identity as a Hamburger that is authenticated by his unmistakable Hamburg brogue, Masakoi is denied national belonging. Isolated from other black people during the war, he is also denied racial belonging, finally finding kinship only with his fellow non-Aryans, the Jewish-Italian Giordano family. Yet after the war, while the Giordanos are awarded victim compensation by the British military government, Masakoi is refused because he doesn't, uh, quote, belong to any of the categories. Masakoi's condition of broken citizenship is alleviated only when, after the war, he is able to secure a Liberian passport that, he writes, would once and for all end my existence in the nationality twilight zone in which I had lived for so long under the Nazis. Yet even as he recounts such adversity, Masakoi positions himself in his memoir in the role of eyewitness to the rise of the Nazi regime rather than victim. Similarly, Adujin is more interested, I think, in exploring the position of witness and bystander than that of victim. Uh, the act of witnessing is foregrounded in both texts, for example, uh, in scenes in which the narrators view up close the devastation of Kristallnacht. Um, I won't read these, uh, these passages out, though, in the interests of time. The black protagonists of both narratives also witness the suffering of Jewish friends, in Masakoi's case, of his childhood playmate Klaus, and later of the Giordano family, uh, and in the novel of the German Jewish pianist Paul. Yet Adujin also significantly reconfigures the witness perspective of Masakoi's memoir. Destined to witness stages the distance between the experiencing eye of Masakoi's youthful self and the mature narrating eye that retrospectively reflects on his earlier experience and imbues it with meaning. In Half-Blood Blues, however, the narrating eye is distanced not only temporally, but also culturally and experientially. The novel denies the reader direct access to the black uh, German victim's first person narrative that Masakoi provides, instead offering us that of an African American bystander, which I think is a really uh, interesting choice that she makes. By introducing this additional layer of mediation, this distancing device, Adujan reflects on her own diasporic distance from the events she depicts as a Canadian writer born well after the war. Um, so to conclude, I want to propose that Adujan's introduction of an African-American narrator ultimately is a means of staging the problem of memory itself. Half-Blood Blues repeatedly draws attention to the difficulty of producing a historical narrative of black victims, uh, victimhood under the Nazis. In a documentary about Hieronymus Falk that is screened at a Berlin uh, festival held in his honor, a scholar explains, quote, of course, it's hard to get a sense of how many blacks actually went to the camps because so many records were destroyed. These people are lost in the dark maw of history. It's only by virtue of the chance recovery of a musical recording of the band that Hieronymus's memory endures. And I quote again from the novel, the kid's existence might have been a fiction we'd all cooked up if that disc hadn't survived. 
the kid could have been lost to history easy as anything. So while Massacoy is destined to witness presents a story of survival, Half-Blood Blues does not so much depict the survival of an individual as it does the survival of memory and its transmission across African diaspora mnemonic networks. Thank you. Is this working? Yes. Uh, so I have a lot of questions, but I'll just start with one, and then if no one else has any, I'll keep going. Um, <laughs> Philip, I was wondering for you, um, thank you for reminding us about the separation of the different zones. I was wondering, were there any black Austrians born in the French zones, in the British zones? Because there could have been, right? So I'm wondering about these people. Um, and also thank you for reminding us how religion plays a role, because I was thinking too about Ika Hugo Marshall's autobiography and how she was beaten, it she was, she's um, Protestant, but she was beaten by the, the nuns or uh, the Schwesta, you know, and sent to Hamburg or somewhere to be beaten and be exercised basically be because of her blackness. And so I was hoping that you could maybe also share, talk a little bit more about religion in upbringing too, like not, I know you talked about the beginning and having children out of wedlock, but I'm, I'm wondering in the, like at Siong, is there anything um, with religion happening there? Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, especially in the French zone, you had also um, children of black, of uh, soldiers from the, the, the Maghreb region. So they had colonial troops and they were sent to the west of Austria. And um, I think the numbers are unclear, but, but approximately, 100 of, of, of these children were also born in, in, in Austria. Um, also, I mean, if we take about, uh, if, if we talk about um, discrimination on, on, on basis of the color of the skin, uh, you had also um, troops in like um, Central Asian Republic troops in the, in the Soviet Union formation. So that played also an, an, an role. And um, yeah. Um, what is, what is hard to answer is um, we don't know where the mothers from which parts of Austria the mothers were from. Yeah? So what, what could happen, and this was also a thing we um, didn't realize in the very beginning, is of course that one of the mothers could have gone to Salzburg, but the child was born, for example, in another part of the occupation zone. So that was somehow in the design, I would say, a mistake. Yeah? because um, you can see that they move around like Austria. Yeah? So it's not just because the American occupation zone was like Upper Austria, Salzburg and Vienna, that they had to stay there. It was not the case. And religion played, of course, especially if we talk about the children born out of wedlock, a very important role, yeah? especially in Salzburg, which was not uh, just very national socialist, it was also very Catholic. Yeah? So um, this played a very important role, and also if we talk about adoptions, I wasn't addressing adoptions, but this played also a very important role, because um, adoptions to the United States had, um, were somehow organize, organized on the basis of religion. Yeah? So it was also necessary like to find a Catholic couple, for example, or actually to change the religion of um, the, the child you're talking about, which led also to very weird discussions between Protestants and Catholics. Yeah. The 
Oh, um, Priscilla, for you, um, I was thinking about um, Sandrine and Sharon have um, in their book, the little book of, help me out, the little book of visions. Yeah. Um, and she talks about space within that. And so I wanted to make sure that I remind, uh, remember to uh, tell you about that. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about the constellations that Simone shows at the beginning of the play, if they're stories that were important to, like, uh, you know, they all have different stories and whatever, right? So I'm wondering, does that somehow fit into her larger narrative of the performance or not? Yeah, thanks uh, for your comment. I don't, I don't know the little book of vision, so I'll definitely look into that. The question about the constellations, <laughs> I've, I'd have to probably sit down with a astronomer or something. I, I don't know anything about constellations, but it's, I mean, it's totally possible that that's what she's showing. I mean, um, as far as Afrofuturism goes, like, some people like to go way far back and think about uh, Dogon, uh, like ast astronomy. So think about the, the ways that um, um, African uh, African uh, tribes were able to to see or identify constellations way before we had a telescope. So it could be that she's she's you know playing into a larger history of, of like uh, the African diaspora and the cosmos. But um, yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm gonna identify. <laughs> Let's see, figure out if those are constellations or not. But I might have to find an expert to just sit down with me. This is a question for Philip. Uh, I was really interested when you talked about uh, these black Austrians having to come to terms with their blackness, especially in light of the fact that they had no models. Uh, I like the example you gave of Petra, I think it was, when he responded back to the person speaking to him in broken German and uh, criticized his German. He, in a sense, made that person um, come to terms with his blackness. I wondered two things, if you had any other examples of that, or if any of the narratives reflected uh, uh, examples of them being in uh, danger during their period of growing up in Syria, under serious threat. Thank you for the question, Sam. Yeah, we have many examples like that as an, as an individual strategy. So I do remember that, and that that was not um, in the in the sixties or in the seventies. Mm -hmm. That happened, um, I think, two thousand and five. One of our interviewers was trying um, to get a new driver's license, yeah, and um, he went um, to the magistrate, where like to this to this place where where he had to to pick it up, and then this person started talking to him in broken German again. If you want to have this, you have to sign here, but but like really in a broken way. And he kept like repeating this broken way mm -hmm. until to a certain point when he said, okay, but if you talk to me normally, I will understand you. <laughs> so that, that was also, um, um, and then we have much more um, 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 examples like that happened very, very often. Yeah? Uh, people being in, 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 in danger. I mean, we, when we looked for interview partners, we um, didn't, approach them. It was very um, important for us that they want to get interviewed by us. Yeah? So what we did was actually um, we published an, uh, an article in different newspapers and um, the, the, the people got in contact with us when they wanted to participate um, on, on, on our project. And that, that means um, like to some extent, like the people we interview, you'd had to come to terms. So they were so that means um, like you, you just get a certain segment, yeah? people who want to talk to you. But um, yes, I would say a lot of um, people were in, in, in threat and I think that that, that, that was um, in danger. And I think that was um, um, for, the, for the early generations, like the, 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 the 46, 47 born one, even um, 
I would say a bigger case. I could see it in the in the in the in the files of the of the um, youth welfare departments. Yeah. Um. Thank you. One quick question uh, about the Stegman book. Could you just say a word uh, about the reception of that work? No, this is for um, Sarah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is it Stegman? Yeah. 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 The reception. Um, thank you. Um, as I mentioned very briefly, it was. Uh, very well received in Canada, it won the Giller Prize. It got a fair bit of attention. It was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize in England, but it uh, there was this reaction. She she writes about this of festival audiences saying, "Why are you writing about a, an experience so distant from your own? Why are you writing about Europe setting this novel in Paris and Berlin and in this historical period? What does this have to do with you know with your own life?" And so she, uh, in the um, I, I mentioned this talk that she gives where she. Um, uses this term broken citizenship. She says, in fact, she sees a lot of connections between her own, um, her own life experience and this one that appears uh, historically distant. I think part of the reaction was because the Canadian press really had no concept of a black German history, and so partly they just found this a very anomalous story. They didn't know how, what to make of it. They didn't have any context for it. Um, there was also, this is a very particular Canadian dynamic, the, the, the novels that year that were, um, that were shortlisted for prizes uh, mostly weren't set in Canada, and that created a lot of anxiety about, well, where's the Canadianness of our literature? So that was part of the background to this, too. That's a very Canadian issue. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so it was sort of an, a mixed response, uh, in a sense. Um, and I think, um, uh, also, as I mentioned, I think didn't recognize that there is a very long history of African diaspora intellectuals commenting on the Holocaust, I mean, Césaire, uh, particularly in discourse on colonialism, um, uh, making an argument against European colonialism that in part through uh, linkages to European fascism that's directed inward. So I, I see her also in working in that direction. Me again? Okay. Oh, sorry, I'll be really quick. Um, Sarah, um, I was wondering, oh, have you seen the movie The Black Survivors of the Holocaust? that th it's a documentary, it's yes. narrated by James Earl Jones, it's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, yes. so I just want to make sure you knew that. And the, um, I was wondering if, if you felt like both works, I know you're, you're seeing how, how different they are, but I was kind of wondering if the performance, this performativity was similar. I feel like in Massacoy's autobiography, he definitely, had you say, positions himself in a certain way. He's, is, there's this a lot of performative moments, right, where he's, um, analyzing himself, and I haven't read Half-Blood Blues, I just know about it, but I'm wondering too, do, do you find that performative nature in it, maybe through the third person narrator, like stylistically, if maybe you could, you could um, speak to that. And I just wanted to say the, what you were saying about the, the fiction of the, these black authors, Maye, right, mm -hmm. and um, the and other and authors, um, if, I felt like they were doing something like Cydia Hartman did with Venus, and where she was looking through the archive and not able to find mm -hmm. um, the story of the Venus hot and tot in Europe, and so therefore wrote a play that gave her agency in what she wasn't able to find in a traditional narrative. So do you also think that that's th their story? Yeah, thank you. Those are great um, uh, comments. I, um, I had thought actually particularly about neo-slave narratives uh, in relation to that sort of relationship to the archive. Um, f uh, so uh, Sadie Hartman, but also, um, for example, Maurice Condé writing about Tichaba and the Salem witch trials. She finds this figure who's a footnote to the historical record and then imaginatively creates this biography for her. So I, I see it as very parallel to that, what they're doing. I was mentioning um, to Mark earlier that um, uh, the Williams novel, uh, Clifford's Blues, which I showed the cover of, he describes visiting Dachau and seeing a photograph of a black prisoner and wanting to know who was this person and not being able to find the information. And therefore, he you know, writes this novel in a sense to compensate for the absence of that historical record. Um, so yes, so absolutely. Uh, the first question, I've forgotten now. Oh, yeah. Um, well, of course, performance is it's about 
musicians, so there's also that sort of dimension of performance in the text. But I, I guess I'm especially interested in this choice of, um, of uh, voicing the novel through the African-American narrator from Baltimore as a, as a black Canadian writer. That's the kind of ventriloquism that she performs. And I, I've been thinking about that in terms of her uh, reflecting on her own kind of distanced, heavily mediated relationship to the, to the past that she is attempting to, to uh, connect with. So I think that's quite different from what we see in Maez and um, Williams's novel, where there's a much more direct first person narration of the victim's experience. Uh, and they uh, use the diary form because it's a first person narrative that provides full access to that. Whereas Adujan is very deliberately, I think, um, not allowing the reader full uh, full um, entry into the perspective of the black German character. And I think that is a, a, a way of performing her own um, uh, distance and, and the difficulty also of accessing the historical archive. Link to your other question. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for Philip. You mentioned that Child Protective Services was involved with adoptions. Was this really to protect the child or to protect the mother um, as they pushed adoption to get the Afro-Austrian child out of the country, perhaps? Um, and was that across Europe that they were trying to get rid of their Afro uh, children? Yeah, that's um, a big question because um, many motives stand behind it. I think the main motive for the social welfare authorities was a financial aspect, in fact, eh? because um, um, they couldn't get any um, alimonies from the fathers. And that meant, I mean, like the mothers were very often very young and um, had, in many cases, no support from the families. And nevertheless, like the, 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 the Child Protective Service had to step in had, had to step in financially. And um, I think um, that one of the reasons why they wanted um, to get um, rid of these children was actually they didn't want to pay for it. And um, the racism gave them a very good excuse to um, actually link it to the financial um, um, argument. And that, 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 was, that was the case in Austria, and I know that to some extent um, that that was also one of um, the, the motives in, in Germany, as um, Yara Colet Muniz del Fare pointed out. Um, she brought about like the German welfare situation. But um, what is um, what makes um, the I would say Austrian situation special is that you didn't have any discussions about the future of these children, not at all. So that meant, I mean, in Germany you had like different steps of discussions. At first, they wanted to get rid of these children for different reasons. Yeah. One of them, like all of them were racist, but liberally framed and then the open racist framed. Then they thought about like um, letting these children grow up in Germany, but isolated in, 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 in um, orphanages or something like this. And in the very end, like liberal parts of the German society were trying somehow to show the world that Germany has become more democratic and by like in integrating uh, these children into society and by publishing also educational material for teachers yeah, during like the schooling process that never happened in Austria. Like Austria was somehow like stuck to this um, idea of sending them away and since there was no discussion, they could do on a, I would say, um, low bureaucratic level what they wanted to do. Yeah, if um, they could set like the matters under pressure or something like this. But I would say like this um, financial aspect is a main aspect, and it was also articulated um, by uh, I don't know the, the head of the state of Salzburg after the occupation. Yeah, he said this is a big financial problem we have to solve. Very open in the chronic of the of the state. Do we have time for one more question or? No more questions? Okay, well let's give a round of applause to our excellent panelists.